and we'll get going. Um, all right, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm Amanda Marlin, Executive Director with EOS Eco Energy, um, and also coordinator for the Chignecto Climate Change Collaborative. Um, all right, so welcome to the presentation on salt marshes for climate risk reduction. Before we get started, um, I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge that our work here at EOS EcoEnergy is done on the traditional unceded lands and waters of the Mi'kmaq. Today's webinar is part of our event series called How Nature Can Help Us Adapt to Climate Change. And I'll place the link to the event series in the chat box in a little bit in case you're interested in the rest of our lineup. We do have a couple more talks coming up in February. Um, and this event has been organized in partnership with the Chignecto Climate Change Collaborative. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's a network of professionals working on climate change adaptation issues in the Chignecto border region. And today's speaker is uh, Danica Van Kruisde. Danica is a coastal geomorphologist and professor at St. Mary's University in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies, applying 25 years of experience in coastal ecosystem response to natural and human drivers of change to the restoration of tidal wetland habitat and the design of nature-based climate change adaptation strategies. She's the co-founder and director of Transcoastal Adaptations, which is a center for nature-based solutions, and has over 20 years of applied ecosystem-based coastal adaptation projects and vulnerability assessments in Canada, in the Caribbean, and in the Indian Ocean. But she's most happy slogging through the mud and paddling in the Bay of Fundy here. So welcome, Danica. Before I turn things over to you, though, I just want to ask everyone again to remain muted and that we'll keep questions until the end, just so that we can stay on schedule and Danica can get through what she'd like to share with you this afternoon. So um, if you are thinking of questions as we go, though, please write them in the chat box and I can relay them to Danica. I'll monitor the chat box through our talk, um, but I'll also open things up for verbal questions at the end. You can raise your hand and we'll have time for some questions. So um, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you especially to Danica, and I'll turn things over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Amanda. I'll just get myself set up here. Great. So should, you should all be seeing my screen. Okay. Okay. There we go. All right. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining me here today. I'm just going to move this over for joining us today. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be sharing some of the work that we've been doing um, at St. Mary's University at Transcoastal Adaptations Center for Nature-Based Solutions. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be sort of setting the stage in context about how salt marshes can be used to help decrease our risk to climate change. And most of the work I'm going to focus on, in fact, I would say all the examples that I'm going to focus on today are going to be focused within the Bay of Fundy. So in terms of the geographical concept, in, within the Bay of Fundy, um, most of the lands are protected by about 364 kilometers of dikes and associated infrastructure, and this protects about 80,000 acres of low-lying land behind them. And these lands originally arose as a result of diking for agricultural purposes at the time of the Acadians. And in this time, they would use one-way gates and including with modernization of the Dykeland systems, we have one-way Aboto gates that you see here on the lower left. On the left-hand side, what you're, look, what you're seeing, this is a map of tidal barriers within the Bay of Fundy that was done uh, a while back with the Ecology Action Center. And you can note the series of complete obstructions, partial and no restriction. And so these are really have influenced how the landscape is used behind and has also influenced um, a lot of issues from uh, loss of wetland habitat to fish passes issues. Lands behind the dikes now because they are um, protect or they're, they no longer receive regular input of sediments from the sediment laden tidal waters, the foreshore marsh or the marsh in front of front of the dike grows up in elevation, but the land behind subsides. So this means that when you do have a major flood event, um, that there is uh, harder chances for that water to drain off, as you can see the example in 2004 in Truro. So that mostly coincides with a very heavy rainfall event. And when high tide, keep those Aboto gates shut. Now, 
we also know that this is an area of significant vulnerability. And in fact, the Chignecto Isthmus has been identified as one of the two most vulnerable areas to climate change on the continent. And as you can see on the image with the Chignecto rail within the, within the Isthmus, that even that at a very high tide event, the infrastructure behind is at risk. And estimates place the disruption in trade of about $15 million a day in trade would be lost if we have overtopping within the Isthmus area. But one of the things we have to recognize is that uh, from a historical and even contemporary context, that our landscapes are ever changing and they're ever changing in response to our activities. So ranging from construction of a tidal uh, of, a, of a causeway, for example, as you see here in the Windsor Causeway, where we have, this would have been the image in 1955 and the new position of the causeway in this location. This resulted in a very rapid sedimentation and an, an entire evolution of a vibrant and actually quite very, very productive um, tidal wetland uh, salt marsh downstream of that causeway. And in fact, the amount of marsh that was created downstream has actually is actually more land than that was lost upstream as a result of the, to the causeway. But then we have other issues of removing barriers and reintroducing tidal flows into particular areas. And so everything really needs to respond to those changing landscapes and recognize that um, the impacts that we have today impact the future, but that also um, unintended consequences can also arise. As we look at on the far right hand side, this was in the halfway river, um, which is close to the Avon River system itself where tidal as a result of a failing a private uh, dike system and Abo system, tidal waters were reintroduced. Now this actually stimulated uh, some significant marsh growth very rapidly, but it also put um, at risk infrastructure around the area. Um, that's a longer question that we can, we can debate at another time, but it, it means that communication is really important as we start to think about how we change our landscapes to respond to climate change adaptation. It's gonna be one of the themes I'm gonna use as we move through. So from a vulnerability perspective, um, we know that the Upper Bay of Fundy in particular is highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And if we use, although these, uh, we have updated projections now, um, the relative sea level rise within the Bay of Fundy is gonna be up to about 40 centimeters by 2055. But one of the things in the Upper Bay in particular is this, I, this aspect of an in, enhanced, um, increase or amplification of your higher tide events. And so if we look at this in red, we can see that that has an impact on um, sites that are within the Bay of Fundy, but not within Halifax itself. And so if we add those different components over the next 24 years or so, we have a relative sea level rise of up to about 80 centimeters. If we use a historical Saxby Gale as an example of areas that would be flooded, the depiction on the right hand side shows the area that would be flooded with a potential very significant storm event. So it's really critically important that we uh, look at ways of how we can mitigate these vulnerabilities. And so setting into the context of some of the terms that I will be used as well, the most important one that we're referring to is the foreshore marsh. The foreshore salt marsh, this is salt marsh that's located seawards of dike infrastructure. And as I mentioned previously, the dike infrastructure uh, is raised to a particular elevation to protect agricultural land. And, and that is the mandate to protect those lands and the infrastructure behind them. But the land behind subsides because it's no longer being regularly flooded by, um, by those sediment laden, laden tides. Increased development has meant that we now have homes and infrastructure that are beyond what's referred to as the marshland boundary. The boundary that you see here delineated behind the dike, those were derived in the 1940s, 1950s as a result of the high water mark, generally the high water mark at that time. And with sea level rise, we know that those lines are going to be that those zones are wider, um, but they were the areas where development would have been restricted as we started to grow our populations behind the dike infrastructure. But those foreshore marshes form the first line of defense. And it's well known internationally that 
coastal habitats such as oyster reefs, tidal marshes, seagrasses, they provide that first line of defense for coastal, for coastal communities. And in fact, in some areas of the world, the creation of foreshore marsh and the presence of foreshore marsh is actually integrated into engineering design to allow for the height of a dike to actually be lower. And you can see depicted here, the, uh, the dike is not overtopped or damaged for the same amount of wave energy reaching, because we're going to explain that those larger waves are um, decreased in height when they interact with the vegetation. And when vegetation is not there, you have the direct impact of a storm event directly on the dike itself. So if we think of some of the protective functions that salt marshes can provide, they can provide a wide, wide ranges. So we have the attenuation of waves, we have the stabilization of sediments and accretion of sediments. And particularly in the last uh, decade, there has been, and really in the last five years, there has been increased scientific and empirical research to demonstrate the effectiveness of these properties. And uh, Duwatt's paper in Nature Climate Change really kind of summarizes the additional benefits of uptake of CO2 and carbon sequestration, which is helps to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. We see decrease in wave energy dissipation. We also see particle trapping. This particle trapping and sedimentation is really um, speaks to the resilience or the ability for those marshes to keep up with sea level rise. On the table in the bottom, you can see the sedimentation uh, accretion and elevation rates of veg vegetated coastal wetlands. Now they're two different numbers because the vegetation or a marsh, it's a marsh, salt marsh has both a sediment that growth that falls in from a tide, but also the roots themselves also grow and contribute to uh, the elevational gain. All of these work together to help a marsh be resilient and to help protect our coastal communities. And in fact, there's a lot of growing evidence for the climate change adaptation uh, benefits. As I quote, coastal wetlands prevented property loss worth 625 million during the 2012 Hurricane Sandy, according, according to one study published in Natural Disasters. Another from the Insurance Bureau of Canada, natural infrastructure can offer other valuable environmental and social benefits that are often not attainable through the implementation of great engineered solutions. And the IBC um, report coming out in 2018 was really some of the earlier signs of a sort of a change in appreciation at the national level of the benefits of those nature-based solutions. And in fact, that appreciation has exploded um, really over the, over the last uh, four years. And some of the co-benefits is because of a lot of the co-benefits that are offered by tidal wetlands that we're seeing the more of a return on the investment than traditional, just simple gray infrastructure. And many of these co-benefits include stormwater retention and filtration, the habitat creation. So I mentioned about the, the uh, Windsor Causeway and the salt marsh that developed uh, beneath, beneath that and, and also some of the marshes that developed uh, downstream of the Petakodiak River again. And the series of environmental services. So migra uh, migration corridors, habitats for species, primary productivity and carbon storage. In addition, they provide erosion protection primarily through the wave energy dissipation, but also by the sheer presence of the actual foreshore and, and mass of, of roots and, and peat that exist within the marsh proper. They provide fish habitat, particularly in nursery and foraging fish, and are increasingly, as I mentioned, being adopted within green infrastructure within Canada and internationally. So as, I, as Amanda mentioned earlier, um, that I've been working along with my colleagues, so CB Wetlands Environmental Specialist and the province of uh, restoring tidal wetlands within, within Nova Scotia. And we have over 17 years of restoration and collaboration in the area, starting with the first projects, uh, Chevry Creek in 2005, which was originally in initiated with the Ecology Action Center. And through there, we have restored close to 400 hectares of tidal wetland habitat 
at 13 different, different sites. And I'll be using some examples to talk about this today. And most recently, the Truro North Onslow project, um, which has been in the works for, for quite some time, uh, first tidal waters were reintroduced in early November of 2021, and that was quite exciting. And part of the way we've, we've learned a lot about these different systems and how they respond, and we've got to increase confidence in the restoration trajectory, is because over those last 17 years, we've been using standardized sets of monitoring protocols. So we measure four key processes or variables that we measure in a systematic way so that we can compare between years, and we do pre and post uh, assessments for up to five years, in some cases up to 10 years, depending on the particular site. And some of these sites also become living laboratories where students go and they are they benefit from the wealth of data that are available, as well as conduct experiments on their own as well. And if anyone is interested in conducting research on any of the sites that we have restored, please don't hesitate to contact me because we'd love to have you join a part of our research program. The variables that we, we measure are ones that are critical for a healthy marsh to function. And the first and fundamental one of those is hydrology. If you don't have proper hydrology, and that means a way for water to enter, but also a, a way for water to enter into a site regularly, but also drain and move around the site. So the presence and the integration of tidal creek networks are really important. In many of our sites that were former agricultural lands, the relic ditches form, form part of and actually an important component within that network. And by using a variety of different tools and modeling and include or GIS, um, we're able to track and predict the, the trajectory of where that water is going to go to make sure that we either reconnect particular sections or we block off particular channels if there's going to be a, um, a, a pooling of water um, in areas that is, are going to cause uh, conditions to become not favorable for the plants to establish. The second one is the geomorphology. So that's where you need to really, we look at uh, changes in elevation and also the changes in that landscape. So where you have the new creeks that are forming and developing. And we use a, we use a lot of um, uh, aerial imagery taken by, uh, by drones that we have that we fly. And we can also use those um, surface elevation models that, that are derived to get really accurate three-dimensional representation of those particular landscapes. Sediments and soils are really important because they actually are, it's a, it allows us, provides a substrate upon which plants can grow. It also provides a quantitative measure of the amount of carbon. And so we can then use those, and we're starting to use those um, now to start to calculate how much carbon is being sequestered or entered in, into these different salt marsh systems. So um, being able to be used in the future, perhaps for some carbon accounting. And finally, the final one, which we measure and we also monitor because it's a very important indicator of the health is the, the reestablishment of vegetation. And we will look at the different species that come back, how fast they come back, but also assessment of, of their health. And as I mentioned, we use a variety of different tools ranging from quadrat and, and simple surveys, but also we may use for more complex sites such as the Truro site, we would use hydrodynamic modeling, in this case, Delph 3D, to track and get a better sense of where water is moving in that system. And so based on that experience, we formed Transcoastal Adaptations, um, a center for nature-based solutions at St. Mary's University with a mission to help build climate resilient coastal communities and ecosystems, protecting, enhancing, and restoring natural processes through innovative research collaboration, implementing nature-based adaptation solutions. And so we have three primary pillars, if you will, within the center, research and innovation, education and outreach, and then the application, the on the ground implementation of these activities. And we support a variety of different groups and organizations in order to be able to do so. And in fact, this, it allows us to bring together all those wonderful people in the region that have been working on nature-based solutions and also climate change adaptation. Because ultimately we want to enhance resilience and 
by resilience, I mean the capacity of the natural system to recover from a disturbance event. And so we can enhance the resilience of the natural system, okay, so we can convert a degraded system to a healthier system, or we can create conditions for a new marsh to establish itself um, to enhance a marsh's capacity to respond to storms and respond to rising sea levels. And if we do this, if we are careful about how we do this, we can have actually quite rapid uh, recolonization within the Bay of Fundy context. So if we look on the left, on the, the top, this is the Walton River uh, restoration. This was a freshwater impoundment. This is it post brief, immediately post brief in 2006. 15 months later, it was completely covered by Spartina alterna flora canopy or Spirobolus now uh, a canopy. So very quick that we did no planting on that particular site, very rapid, rapid recruitment. Now, the key to resilience for salt marshes and their climate change adaptation benefits is this diagram right here. So every time that those tidal waters come in, they bring, they bring water to flush out um, uh, toxins and chemicals that can sometimes uh, rise in, but they also bring in nutrients, they bring in sediments. That then allows the marsh to grow up. If you have proper hydrology, that allows for happy roots. Those roots will, will allow for, they'll grow and they'll expand. And they allow us to, allow us, sorry, it allows the marsh to rise up within the tidal frame over time. So as long as the rate of surface elevation change is greater than the rate of sea level rise, your marsh will be happy and healthy. We really benefit, particularly in the upper bay, by the fact that we have a whole whack of um, suspended, high suspended sediment concentration. So the marshes in our upper bay are quite happy. In the lower bay, however, we have less concentration, and so we are seeing some signs of stress within those marsh systems. Um, and it, it does require some further, further understanding. So in areas that don't have as much um, sediment coming in, they depend a lot more on having the below ground matter and the very, so that it becomes very susceptible to waterlogged conditions, which may then cause a decay or de degeneration of that root mat. But the principle that we operate under in most cases in our experience has been to try to leverage natural processes and that capacity to self-engineer. And in some of our earlier work that, that we did, we would do um, minimal excavate, channel excavation and allow the, that natural system to kind of reestablish it themselves. So you can see um, that in the St. Croix site that we see here, and we allow the natural re readjustment. We have found um, over time that this allows for a more natural pattern and meander to, to begin as the creeks start to evolve more of a natural, natural environment. But one of the things we have to recognize is that coastal marshes occupy a landscape modified by past decisions and actions. So how we actually modify or mitigate some of these is going to be affected by what's behind, what, what is affecting its ability to migrate in a particular, particular area. And so to keep pace with sea level rise, marshes have to be able to migrate. And often the path for their migration is going to be impeded by human activity. In, in, our case, in many cases for us, it would be roads and dikelands. So the strategy is to try to make room for movement of those, for make room for, for natural movement of those tidal wetland ecosystems, either through managed dike realignment, where we take a section of dike strategically realign in a new location, reintroduce tidal flow, and a tidal marsh actually will establish in that location, or perhaps through culvert enlargement, where we're reintroducing, we're, in, we're allowing more water to move into a system, as we see with the Chevry Creek site. And we can see these transforming landscapes, and it, it requires, by in us doing this, it requires us to reimagining, reimagine and how our way of thinking of a particular landscape area. And it, it requires us reimagining coastal use and function. So if we use an example of our Belcher Street site, this our management in November 2017, this is prior to this is the dike that's going to be realigned. This is prior, this is just agriculture and fallow field here, which was poorly drained. The tides were returned in 2018. And by 2020, we have a fully restored tidal wetland, but it did change and alter how that landscape was being used. 
Um, and this dike is used actively as a walking corridor and some of the coastal residents have exclaimed that they haven't, it's the first time they saw butterflies within the area. Now I know this is really busy, but all I want to say about this, this slide is that it's also messy, it's complicated. And when we start talking about these trade offs, there's a lot of different things you want to be able to think of. So part of the um, NSERG ResNet project, um, we are uh, Dalhousie and St. Mary's is co-leading the Dykeland landscape with Kate, Kate Sharon and Jeremy Lundholm and measuring and mapping all of the, 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 the co-benefits and also the trade-offs and challenges that exist because both lands, the Dykelands and the marshlands provide a series of ecosystem services, whether they're provisioning and material services such as uh, wild foods or foods for crop and fodder, whether they're cultural or non-material uh, such as Mi'kmaq identity or bird watching and education, or if they're regulating, so stormwater protection, flood water management and carbon sequestration and erosion control. And those are ones that I'm gonna focus on more for the rest of this talk. But the effectiveness of the foreshore marsh itself is not, is not equal everywhere. And so the ability of that marsh to provide those functions is gonna be affected by the condition of the foreshore, um, and so an example that we can see here, this is a, uh, a degraded foreshore actually that is subsiding and we're seeing exposed peat uh, down in, in the, um, down in the, down the lower bay. We can see others that are expanding and prograding as we see up in the Minas Basin, some eroding and some newly forming. So we have to think of the condition of the foreshore, the geomorphology, uh, so whether it is a cliff or a ramped marsh, the platform elevation within the tidal frame, so how deep is the water when the tides come over it? Is it eroding or expanding? How exposed is it? And what is the sediment supply? And I'll explain the, the image on the, the bottom uh, in, a, in a moment more clearly. But basically what that is saying is that research has shown, and there's a lot of research that, that has shown this both in the lab and in the field, that how effective a uh, a vegetation is at, at dampening those waves is a complete function of how much of that a plant matter occupies the entire water column. And so part of a way to add um, more information and more empirical, empirical research into the effectiveness in the Canadian context, uh, we are part of a larger national scale um, nature-based resilience project led by the National Research Council. And the Shignecto Isthmus is one of the uh, projects in which I am co-leading with Gavin Nansen um, from the Geological Survey of Canada. And we're looking at the effectiveness of vegetated foreshore marshes and managed like realignment for risk reduction, the Shignecto Isthmus. And so this involves experiments on natural marshes, on uh, using physical scale models that are built at the National Research Council. And so what you see here on the left hand side, this is actually a simulated um, a foreshore dike which was constructed within their wave flume. And we can then quantify how effective uh, vegetation is at preventing overtopping or using um, hydrodynamic models and numerical modeling with colleagues at the University of Ottawa in Queens. And in terms of field deployments, we have been hampered by COVID, but we have been able to deploy a wide range of instrumentation within both in 2020 and 2020, uh, 2021 and 2022, 2021 to 2021, sorry about that. Um, and in the field, apart from having instruments out in the deeper, deeper waters, in the intertidal zone, we have a linear array of RBRs. These are, these are instruments that measure um, wave height uh, as a result of pressure pressure fluctuations. And what we want to look at is we want to look at how how much does how much is the wave height decreased as we move further into that vegetated canopy. So the experiments are set up exactly the same way. And if I look at the results from a natural marsh in Clifton, we weren't able to come across the border. So uh, Maka had conducted her honors in uh, in the minus basin, and, and you can see the array of instruments. So as I mentioned before, we're looking at everything relative to the mudflat unvegetated as you move further into the, into the system. And on the top side for, as I mentioned, water depth has a role. And so what we did is you break up um, the, 
tides that had water depths that are less than one meter above the marsh platform. And then what was, what was the size or how big were the waves? And we then looked at what was the distance from the mudflat um, on attenuation. And we see that within 15 meters of, of, of the, the instrument, so that is actually 10 meters within that marsh surface, we actually have, for those larger waves, 80% uh, decrease in wave height uh, for those, for those um, tides that are, that are born storm water depths that are much higher, and 100% uh, 50 meters in. For waves that are gr greater than one meter, however, um, we don't see that same effect. We do see about 62% reduction or 50% reduction within 50 meters, so 45 meters within the vegetated canopy. So that means that areas where we have, um, where the foreshore marsh is lower, we have higher water levels, um, they give a decreased amount of protection but still they do have protection. And so what this means is that if we're considering integrating foreshore mark into dive design, we have to consider what is the elevation of that mar marsh platform. And so if the mean high water of the large tide is less than one meter relative to the marsh platform, we need a minimum of 50 meter for 100% wave energy dissipation. Now this gets longer if we're considering uh, deeper waters that come into a particular area. And the ongoing research and modeling that are, that are continuing this year and next will help us provide more uh, concrete empirical evidence and recommendations for dike width and um, relative protection within, within the upper bay. And as I mentioned, uh, this is being incorporated within other areas of the world. Uh, this is in uh, the Netherlands, where this is actually, these are actually created foreshore marshes. Uh, those are brushwood dams that are used to create cells uh, that they then use dredge material to grow and create foreshore marsh. And this has been seen to, so has it, allowed for the crest elevation of the dike to be decreased by about 0.5 to one meter. And the wave impact on the outer slope has been decreased by about 40 to 70%. If you're interested in learning more, we have a series of, the, it was part of a webinar series that we hosted last year, and you can find uh, transcripts and recordings of that event on our website. As I mentioned, we're using empirical modeling or numerical modeling as well to be able to look at what the impacts are of the broader, um, broader storm impacts, but also what are the impacts of uh, opening up more areas within the Chignecto Isthmus, for example. Um, so we are using the sites that we, so one, um, we're incorporating within the mesh and the design, OLAC, which was restored about 10 years ago. And then our making room for wetland site, a converse that you see on the top right hand side, uh, that is two years post uh, post construction. And they're simulating flood and na hazard naturals for various events and then testing the, what is the impact of opening additional cells. There is research and some evidence from from the from Europe that at some point there is a diminishing return where the protective functions that are provided is actually decreased by potential increased flood risk. So we're going to we're trying to figure out what's that sweet spot between allowing more area to go to, to tidal wetland while not increasing flood risk for for coastal communities. And so one of the other aspects that we're looking at is managed dike realignment through a Making Room for Wetlands project. Now, this is something that is done elsewhere on the right hand side. This is at the Mercani foreshore marsh creation project, where, as I mentioned, they're using brushwood dams, plantings to create new foreshore marsh. We're modeling and <clears throat> monitoring sites um, that are that we're restoring within within the bay. And one of those sites is the Belter Street Restoration. This is on the Gigi Cornwallis River in Jijiwuktuk. This was realigned as part of our Making Room for Wetlands project. This is a coastal restoration DFO funded, funded project that funded the development of a framework for implementing nature, uh, uh, managed realignment and tidal wetland restoration. And so we have restored two sites. One of them is Converse, and this is Belcher, which I'm gonna use as the example. In this case, we restored 6.5 hectares. We reduced the overall dike length. So you can see here where the dike 
is was actually newly constructed, and this was a land that was that was uh, uh, not was fallow, and it was poorly drained. So in the process, we improved access to the remaining land as well as decreased um, infrastructure risk. And this required some innovative. Uh, also nature-based solutions. So we used inverted root wads that you can see being placed in the bank to help um, manage some erosion. And we also compared that to rock armoring, which was located uh, just a bit upstream of that particular site. And if you look at the images on the left from fallow to one year later, fully um, all the sediment laden waters came in to the fully almost fully vegetated canopy in 2020 rapid sedimentation elevational gains and colonization by tidal wetland vegetation the system now going back in 2021 is you know healthy happy um, vibrant lots of evidence of biodiversity uh, including species diversity with our plants and there's been a transition from the initial colonizers to a grass and sedge community so the living shoreline, as I mentioned, we used a hybrid approach, actually using flipping the trees upside down that we use to cut down and make it make the access to the actual site for the construction machinery. And this stimulated a little bit of adaptive management, um, but we see the, the stabilization and this is now fully vegetated in 2021. And if we look, you look at our calculations with our drone, with our DSM of difference, what that means, that's just simply the difference in height uh, between, between two different years. Um, we, can, we can see, this is the living shoreline. So we, we see, we, in both cases, uh, compared to rock, we do see some erosion on the edges of the surface, but we do see generally um, sediment accretion over top. But one of the things if we think about that transforming landscape is if we we need to be reconsidering the sort of agricultural land to fully developed. And this is in the back of the site within two years later. And one of the things we feel really stimulates this is the fact that the high sedimentation rates facilitates this type of colonization. But one of the things we have to remember with all nature-based solutions is we have to anticipate adaptive management. Um, and this adaptive management um, may need to take place to alter drainage patterns that, that may occur. So you may have to be prepared to come in and modify uh, some of how this water is moving, moving through the site. And you can use a variety of different adaptations such as water fences, planting and altered drainage networks. In the Converse site, we've also experienced some adaptive management with the, uh, the new dike that was created. The, uh, the plants, the, the seeding of the actual dike proper, it didn't take as well. The site was also breached within uh, in December. So the timing of the breach itself may also have caused some impact. So we've done some adaptive measures on the, on the infrastructure that remains. And so what are some of the overall lessons learned? Well, it's important of making place-based context. We want to implement these nature-based solutions in many different areas, but we have to recognize that every place is different and we have to make sure we understand both the, the, the landscape differences, but also the cultural and historical uses as they're gonna influence and inform what we, how we go forward. That monitoring is critical and really important because it helps improve our understanding and informs our implementation. Anticipate that you're going to have to make changes in adaptive management. Nature-based solutions are, is, are not solutions that you simply, um, they can be very resilient, but it's not simply, you know, you build it and you completely wash your hands away. It does require a period of monitoring, checking in, adaptive management, particularly we have found in the first two years. And communication is really important, particularly with timely engagement in the project implementation stage and monitoring program. There are enormous uh, opportunities within Canada right now within the Bay of Fundy for implement, implementing nature-based solutions. And a lot of, and we have international guidance and, and uh, documentation now and standards that are developing in the fall, the, the US Army Corps of Engineers led uh, international study for natural and nature-based uh, solutions for features for flood risk management. Uh, engineering guidance for that. We're working with the National Research Council on as part of our, the natural, the nature, uh, natural resilience project to come up with 
guidelines, engineering guidelines for the Canadian context, including winter conditions. So what are some of the take home messages? As I mentioned, every site's unique, important to understand place. Established monitoring can provide significant advances. The timing of restoration activities is really important and planning for adaptive, adaptive management. And the, it's, it requires multidisciplinary approaches. We need to step out of our silos, use non-traditional approaches, non-traditional approaches, non-traditional institutional frameworks. And that also requires us to have a common language and listening. And thank you very much for your time. And I just wanted to, to point out that this was the most magical photo. Um, this was one year after a tide had returned to, and my cat is really loving being here, um, that the tides have returned to the Converse site. Uh, we were monitoring. I was in the kayak measuring inside the site at the high tide and suddenly thousands and I was had been disappointed because I was expecting Belcher had all this grass achieve, arrive within one year. Converts was slower. It was it was muddy. It was dirty. I wouldn't I, I like mud, but it was muddy and it just didn't look like full of life. And as I was paddling and I was taking my measurements, suddenly thousands and thousands of shorebirds came and just flew and they as the tide was falling they were settling and they started feeding on these mud flats and that completely transformed my understanding and my appreciation because the, that mud had life had crow frame it had all little invertebrates that those migrating shorebirds really needed and enjoyed so it, it was sort of a take-home for me about these transitioning landscapes that what may seem and and the importance of visuals to help people understand what can occur but thank you. Oh my gosh, well, thank you, Danica. That's giving me goosebumps at the end to see it really come back to life and to see the birds return. I think that's really special. Um, I'm also getting a kick out of people's comments in the chat about your cat. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and I realize it's really, it's really distracting because I have a background on as well. Um, yes, she has, she has been, yeah, seen in many places. So apologies for that. <laughs> No, that it's great to see everybody's pets at home and, and that. So no, that's great. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have definitely some time here, about 15 minutes for questions. 